Well, I think we have a winner, as we don't know where to start. Well, I don't know about my life, right? So <laughs> there's a lot of we don't know about uh, what to do these days. Um, so, okay, well, that's great. Um, I think we'll definitely touch a little bit on that. Um, so you guys ready to have some fun? Okay, so they, they don't know what's the question yet, okay? They know quite a few questions that's going to come up, but the next question they don't know yet. So I'm going to ask you the first question is, and we can, once the poll is, thank you. Um, so it's going to be a soul searching, gut wrenching, philosophical question. Okay, ready? All right. Do you think AI is going to save or destroy humanity. <laughs> oh, okay, make it easier for you guys. Okay, so they did not know. Yeah, they said <laughs> they don't want to know. So um, you have three choices. A is safe, B is destroy, three is I'm going to think about it. C is I'm going to think about it. I think it's gonna save us. Save us, okay. Yeah, I agree, A. Okay, A. Same A. Oh, okay. Same well, A. I love it. I love optimistic people. <laughs> we are startups, right? So <laughs> um, wonderful. I mean, we can take the deep dive to the drink sessions later, okay? Um, so we're going to do a little bit of product questions. But if you want to discuss more, seek these panelists out. Um, so the next question already on the screen is, can you tell us a little bit about the biggest learning or some advice or your top advice for startups that you do AI? Sure. I, I think just kind of reacting to the poll, a lot of folks don't really know where to start. And they see TechCrunch articles and news kind of coming out around AI, and they're really not sure where to inject that technology. And my biggest piece of advice is to uh, to try things. Um, you know, I think for startups especially, experimentation is a huge advantage that startups have over very large companies that often don't even have the ability to experiment and try things because there's so much legal or procurement or checks and balances in a multi-billion dollar organization that a startup can have an idea on a Monday and test it by a Friday. And so some of the principles of that are really uh, uh, kind of in the lean startup methodology where you come up with a hypothesis. You don't need to build software because oftentimes the software already exists. And so uh, I often recommend what I call the Wizard of Oz technique, which is uh, if you've all seen Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz, you play the wizard and you're the great Oz behind the curtain. And so you can ask users a question collect the data, and then drop it into ChatGPT, see if it's if the generative AI is producing good results. I've seen people take images, drop them into MidJourney, see if that tool produces generative results. And the point of this exercise isn't necessarily to build the product, it's to test the hypothesis that the technology can or can't do a particular function that you're trying to experiment with AI. There's a ton of low-code, no-code tools, and especially for a startup, experimenting, trying things and seeing, okay, I tried it, did it work, did it produce value? Because your job as a startup is to deliver value to potential customers. And so you can experiment very rapidly, try some stuff. Again, we've all heard of ChatGPT, yeah. we've all heard of some of these other tools. Try stuff, see if it delivers value. In some cases you'll discover, okay, I tried that, it didn't deliver any value. That's actually, that's not a bad thing, that's a good thing. Okay, try something else. And you can iterate and try more experiments in a week than a large company can often do in a year. And so use that as a startup to your advantage. So um, about trying fast, yep. get it started, right? Um, and that's that's similar to a lot of the startup philosophy, not yep. just about AI, I would say. Yeah, I mean, yeah. largely, uh, you know, technology trends tend to repeat themselves. And so we're seeing you know, the... The two technology trends that I experienced was the web and kind of every company started to incorporate web technology in the 2000s into their DNA. And then in kind of like 2010, every company started to incorporate mobile technology into. And so we're going through the very early chapters. Every company will incorporate elements of AI into their overall business. 
we're just at kind of the starting gun stages of that as people are experimenting and figuring that out. So huge opportunity for startups in general. Great. Thank you. Um, so, John, do you have anything yeah, to add to this? So we work with a lot of big corporations, earned a lot of pressure to bring AI solutions in. And we really encourage them, start small. Uh, don't don't try to solve the biggest problem right away. There's a lot, there's a lot of process involved, a lot of things to learn. Uh, pick something that will bring you some value. It doesn't have to be the biggest value, but give yourself that opportunity to learn, fill in the pieces that you need around those solutions. You get more familiar. And then, uh, you know, as Greg said, you you then get to a place where you can start to experiment and move forward a lot more quickly on more solutions. And, and I remember we had some past conversations that about people want to design a perfect, you know, solution, perfect system and not getting in there to that small problem, right? Maybe that small problem doesn't look like it's like groundbreaking, but it definitely leads you to the next ones. Um, Lei, how about uh, from your perspective? So what I wanted to add is that AI is a solution, not the business case, not the problems. So always make sure that you deeply understand your problem, your use case, and the needs of your customers, then to search for solutions. And of course, AI could be actually one of the very powerful solutions. So a a uh, mistake that the technologists usually could make, what I see is that they wanted to become an AI business. They wanted to get into this trend space. So they have a solution first, then search for, for, for a problem. That's the, no, that's not the right order. So I wanted to say that we always, especially for startup, for founders, we always need to uh, keep in mind is that what exactly your customers needs. So AI cannot save everything. <laughs> I thought it's going to save humanity. Here. One day. <laughs> <laughs> One day. Okay. Well, wonderful. And I think that actually um, relates to the top challenge we saw earlier on the poll. The poll. Um, want to bring that back, right? Because then we talk about. I think the question is, we don't know what to do, where to start, and we often think as a you know service and consultancy team and company. We see a lot of customers um, go through that initial phase to really understand what the problem is. Because without doing that part, it's really hard to understand, you know, what kind of AI solution, maybe other solution, as to lay your point, right? To use um, any solution, right, that actually is going to solve it. So. So I think that's part of the things is very fundamentally going back to say what exactly you know I'm solving, and then from there to say what are the options, including AI. Um, so yeah, great. Um, for for the next question, then um, we all want to hear about IP as investors or as startups, right? What is the IP? What is the value, you know, behind my product, behind my AI, and how do I build it? What do you think? Um, yeah, we think about IP and long-term defensibility from an investor standpoint a lot. There was a, a pretty well-published blog post a couple months ago from Google. It said, OpenAI has no moat and neither do we. And for startups, thinking about a moat, which is really defensibility, how long-term, if you're building this product or company, how will you provide defensibility? Um, a key element of defensibility, I believe, because every company will start to incorporate AI, um, data and the quality of your solution will increasingly be part of that moat. And so um, the AI platform itself, you know, whether you're using, you know, OpenAI or Anthropic, or you have your own model that you find tuned on Llama or something of that nature, that is going to be harder to be a defensible moat. But unique data that you have within your company, unique IP and prompts, unique industry insights. And that's probably the thing that I've been spending more time with a number of founders is the founders who are building a company, they're not building an AI company. They're building a company in a specific vertical that happens to be using AI. And so their knowledge and expertise within a particular vertical, whether it's 
healthcare or construction or legal or something else, that depth of knowledge and data within that specific industry is going to be the thing that gives them longer term defensibility. And lastly, I think about like, are you building a solution that is an, a broad solution or a deep solution? And by that, I mean, there's a lot of folks who are you know, experimenting with open AI and some of the APIs and be like, oh, I can build a, a Grammarly or something that will do autocorrect for spell check. And it's generally a broad solution. And broad solutions are more difficult to defend because you can kind of anticipate that Google and Microsoft and Apple will start to bake in some of that functionality within the word processor itself. Whereas deep vertical solutions that go into an industry are much more defensible, like if you're you're going within an industry. But that's that's how I kind of think about IP and defensibility. Okay. Well, um, look like John, you have yeah, something yeah. to add there. No, yeah. I, I I very much agree with that. At, at Sienna Analytics, we we built the business around capturing data in logistics, and we had deep expertise, deep domain expertise in logistics, and that was our foundation. We bring in then the analytics and the AI capabilities, but the working with customers so that they can understand the solution. Like to your point earlier, AI is a tool, right? It's helping to solve a problem, but you really need, you need all that data and you need uh, the domain expertise. And that's really the focus uh, of the Sienna business. Okay, yeah, thank you, Lei. Okay. Yeah. So I wanted to step back a little bit to take a holistic view about this AI world or AI space, right? So when you look at the entire picture, right, there are many different layers in the space, starting from the hardware that, for example, NVIDIA is dominant right now, right? So that's the hardware. Then to from the hardware layer, so from the platform layer, let's say the cloud providers, right? Um, that's for example AWS, Azure, right? Then the, the the next layer is the model builder, right? OpenAI is right now is totally the the the, uh, the number one, and then the last one is the application layer, right? Which they are actually pretty crowded in the in the startup space. So it depends on where you are. I think the answer is different. So for example, right? So the the modeling layer that if you are developing a new model or some some uh, some type of model that specialize for example like you, you believe that you can be better than the open AI right that then IP should be in your equation at the at the one right so if you are in the application layer where I think most of startups are located right now because I mean it's really hard to compete with Nvidia at this moment I'm not saying no right everything uh, everything possible right so in that space then I would say that actually I totally agree with Greg is that go to market is the number one uh, priority right so and AI currently actually gave us really good accessibility to those billions the well uh, uh, trained models with billions of parameters so I wouldn't think about a uh, IP at the very beginning I would like basically to prioritize go to market first, right, then to test the value. Then, so you wanted to fine tune in to customize for your specific needs. Then, so IP actually came to equation. So back to the, a lot of the conversation earlier, early to the market and, um, but I think you brought up a good point. So there's different kinds. Some of the, some of us are doing the like innovation in AI itself. Right, versus as applications, I think your point of um, a startup might be solving a solution, solving a problem in med tech and using AI as an enabler or using AI as a, um, a tool behind. So that's, that's a little bit different, right? The, the ones that are solving you know, AI hard tech um, that the next gen of open AI versus the ones using AI to solve really hard problems in other industries it is a different uh, sort of a different animal here right yeah that's right okay um so are there any like hardcore ai company here show a hand here you're doing oh they are yes so mm -hmm. um definitely we but uh it's a, a, a what about uh, show a hands if your company today is using ai or planning to use ai okay so I think a majority of us are 
we definitely have the AI innovators here to do the hard AI stuff, but most of us are doing other hard stuff with AI. Yeah, yeah. okay, wonderful. Um, so that's great. Um, we can take a couple of questions because we want to make this interactive. And I just realized, did I let the audience show hands earlier for the poll? I think I did not. <laughs> we completely missed that. Um, so let's let's take a couple of questions so we can keep it interactive. And in questions from the audience here, I see questions and we can take, we'll try to for now because we only have one hour and we can do more Q&A towards the end for sure. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much um, for being here. My name is Daniel, and I work with a company that uses AI to help immigrants through the immigration and settlement process by providing very personalized information, resources, and community to help you integrate into the new country. So my question is, we for the MVP, we didn't want to, we couldn't afford to build a model from the scratch, so we plugged into the open AI system, but we find that we have to load credits um, ever so often, which is very expensive. So I think the advice is, because we can scale with OpenAI, because if 5,000 people are using the app, or 1 million people, that would be too expensive. So what's your advice in incorporating AI to make that personalization work without being too expensive? Thank you, Danielle. Um, so for the, for the audience virtually, I'll repeat the question if it's not clear. So Danielle's question, Danielle's business is helping immigrants and then um, their business uses AI to advance that uh, cause. And uh, today, the key question here is using something like open AI, it's still costly for an early startup like that, right? Um, any advice on that? Yeah, at a high level, you know, any business, you know, is going to have operational costs that you have to compensate or balance with whatever business model you have. And so I really think, generally speaking, that OpenAI's API, similar to AWS, similar to Azure, similar to Twilio, or other cloud services that you're utilizing to solve a problem are generally pretty cost effective, but it needs something on the other side of the equation. So if you're providing value to your customers, again, if you're charging zero for it, you'll always be imbalanced. If you're providing value, and even if you're charging a dollar, the credits of OpenAI or something should compensate and allow that balance to should work. Um, but again, each startup is a little bit different. Uh, I would often experiment using cloud solutions like OpenAI. There are other, you know, AI tools like Llama, which different characteristics of their model, but much more in your control from a cost perspective as well. Yeah, and the Llama is sort of the um, comparison to OpenAI. That's a open source package. Now, it does require you have some um, software or AI engineer that knows how to wire that together. But I think back to what you are saying, Greg, you are saying also to the MVP, right? It's good to have that open AI kind of, you know, initial um, proof and verifying it works. But when you really need to ramp up, it, the cost does come up, and that's where you need to do some cost analysis, a benefit analysis, if it's better to go for some you know, initial development like with something like Llama. Um, any other thoughts on this? I actually agree with Greg. So given that you are running into a constraint, so you have to make some compromise. So earlier when we said that you need to place, I mean, optimize, prioritize to like go to the market fast, but given that, so you have to compromise saying that. So what is the next uh, possible solution, right? So cause, cause with my knowledge, actually GPT 3.5 is reasonably priced. Uh, so I'm not sure which version you use. The four is expensive. It's a, it's a, it's a lot expensive. If you can compromise and use 3.5, that's probably, I mean, one possible solution. Or just as Greg mentioned that you probably need to step by back to host your own open source model by yourself. The, the only other thing I would add is that, you know, if you are widely successful, like if the reason you're running out of credits is because there's so much demand for your product, 
and you haven't figured out the monetization, that can also be a model to go seek out investment as well, right? Like if you're like, oh my God, like I spun this up, but I haven't optimized pricing, but I have a million people who are trying to get access to this information, you know, that, that demand without necessarily, we haven't figured out the monetization, you know, potentially leveraging capital can help. Um, yeah, I see more hands coming up here. Um, well, I hate to stop people ask questions, so we'll do one more here and then maybe we'll allow it virtual as well. Okay. Uh, hi, uh, I work on a startup now, but my previous job was as a self-driving car company doing DI infrastructure for uh, offline uh, learning. And what I've observed is that um, uh, basically it's a, it's a paradigm shift on how you do software development with AI. So the classic engineering is you write the code, you write your algorithms, we have somebody who tests it for you. With AI, the process is different because it's about data and it's about um, basically evaluation, not testing. Can you speak a bit about this paradigm shift and how the industry is ready or not ready to kind of move along to, to do this type of uh, software development. Um, so for the virtual folks, just a quick recap. The question is that previously, right, the software development agile process we all know is very well defined. So with the AI um, in that mix, how do we, is there a redefined paradigm shift here that for even testing or development, all of those steps how do we think it's going to change i, I realize a pattern i'm going to <laughs> switch people here okay so i'm going to start from the further side for answering if there's an answer yeah and yeah sure sure i'll take this one uh so uh yes actually uh, with this generative uh, generative ai so the paradigm is, is shift so so with my with my knowledge and uh, as we speak so, I mean, it revolves really fast, right? So there are two paths that to develop in the AI space. Uh, so one path, as I mentioned earlier, is that actually, so the AI, AI, the, 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 the current situation, uh, the current uh, uh, paradigm is that, uh, so it does actually give us really good and easy access to, 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 to AI. So for example, so this is the one path that uh, what I'm seeing is that, uh, so the, uh, it looks like the dev process looks like, hey, pro start, start design property, right? Then uh, API calls, then offline evaluation slash, uh, slash UAT, productionization and online, uh, online test. Right, so that's one path, and this is actually a pretty easy path, and you do not need like to hire a team of machine learning engineer or a, a, a expert, and this provides us really easy access to those models that has billions of, uh, uh, billions of parameters and we are trained. Right, so as your, for example, as your uh, uh, as your um, startup grows and you are able to hire a team of experts um, of uh, machine learning or AI, and at that time, I believe your uh, your business also needs like some customizations of your for your specific business case, right? So at that time, actually, the 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 path actually comes back to pretty much similar to where we are right now with let's say more traditional supervised learning um, or reinforcement learnings. That so basically, your team of experts needs to so that actually, I mean, again, come back to data is that uh, come back to Greg's uh, so earlier answer is that your data actually it is provide you like it's your, your uniqueness like in this space to compete so that 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 actually enables you to be able to customize the solution specific for your for your use case so then again so the, the their process comes back to collect label or collect data right clean up massage data uh, uh, collect uh, labels and then basically feature engineering uh, build a model uh, to model, uh, then offline evaluation, and then uh, productionization and uh, uh, online uh, uh, test, right? So this comes back, but I, I would expect that this is coming like after uh, your startup uh, grows uh, bigger and the MVP has already been tested uh, like with great value. And I want to give a shout out of, there's a founder, I think at the corner, <laughs> there he is. Um, Cause I remember I had a conversation with him yesterday and you guys are building some kind of software utilizing AI to aid the next gen of software development. 
right? Right. Right. Okay. So, <laughs> so, um, so a shout out here, and uh, but I think it's a really difficult question. Yes. Um, yeah. So my name is Andres Carrara. I'm a founder of Data Engines, and uh, what we work on is uh, basically algorithms that evaluate experts, right? Because the main problem that we have with AI now, and we're going to have it in the future. And we're going to have it when the intelligent aliens invade too, right? Is how do dummies evaluate experts? You have some AI, right? It gives you an answer. How do you know that it's correct? So can you speak about that difficulty, right? Because most data that is evaluated by or that is processed by AI remains unlabeled forever, right? So that's a tsunami. I love this questions um i think it's good that we have an interactive session even we said the two questions but hey you know this is better right so um so the question here really comes back to how do we evaluate ai right and then we have this layer of quote unquote dummies uh evaluate expert i think a lot of it's number one is there's a lot of black box behind we, we you know who knows what is happening behind of every single layer not like we so-called ai experts we would i'm not going to claim i know every single thing of the neural network of the parameters and all of that but um also the labeling component and uh, um so the labeling component there's a lot of built-in bias in the labeling component as well those who labor so who is to judge what is right and what is wrong Right. Okay. So it is a very philosophical question. <laughs> we started. There is an engineering solution, right? And so this is a, this is a, right the forefront of, of what knowledge. It goes back to the question of whether AI is going to make save us or kill us. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so I say no technology or no tool has ever killed us so far. We have a very good record. Touche. Right? Good point. <laughs> right? Good point. Fire well, it might, faith, might right? assume. But it can but... kill us. <laughs> yes. So we've learned to make fire save us by learning how to be safe from fire. Yeah. So, so I'm saying for AI, the same thing happens, right? Yeah. Yeah. Love this question. Actually, let me let me try. Uh, so I want to change the question a little bit. Is that how do we evaluate the AI response? Right. Um, this is actually an open question. So at, at, at this moment, but I don't think it's a you know it's a huge risk because uh, there are many different ways that um, actually this is also actually what we run into like uh, the day to day like to develop uh, to incorporate AI into our products is that how to manage the risk and how to make sure that the solution of AI is within our lines. It could be not, and don't ask me why I know that. Uh, uh, so, 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 so there are there are a few that actually uh, heated debated that solution. For example, to use AI supervise AI, right? Uh, so, so, so that's actually one possible solution. And there are also, for example, so I mean, it's uh, largely depend depending on the property, right? So this is actually even low hanging fruit is that make sure that the 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 prop team is properly like basically managed right so 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 there are, it, it is an open 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 question and uh, the the community is still discussing that but i believe that there are as i said like using ai supervised ai and uh, uh, to put more human in the loop that's another possibilities before it gets even really power powerful so the, yeah. the thing i was going to add and this kind of touches on both your question as well is you know is this a paradigm shift in software engineering uh, or not and I, I think we're in a very interesting time in ai where a lot of the tools that traditionally exist in more sophisticated mature stages of technology don't necessarily yet exist for ai and i have talked to a number of startups that are working on some of these problems like hey how do we do regression testing on ai models and know that they're getting better without regressing some of the previous things. I've also seen startups exploring the traceability of neurons and in inference. And so we're exploring and building those things. Some of the people who have gotten pretty good at prompt engineering have come up with this notion of a chain of thought, 
where you say, not only do I want you to answer the question, I first want you to explain your chain of thought reasoning. And then each step in that is more provable than the final outcome. And so those things right now require experts to be like, oh, I'm a prompt engineer and I've thought really deeply and experimented a lot. That will become very commonplace where you just ask the question normally and behind the scenes, if it's first doing prompt engineering and then spitting out the answer and supporting its thought process, which again, improves the quality of the actual end result. But like we're in that, like, I, I don't think it's a paradigm shift. I just think the tools don't exist yet. So as a, as a moderator, I'm going to use my, um, my special power here to bring us to a couple of the um, tactical questions. I, I think this is a fantastic, right? I think there's a lot of societal debate behind this as well, just go beyond you know, the application layer. And I think we should engage these conversations afterwards. And, and these are really important conversations. Um, even let's say for evaluation, even beyond, even not talking about what is the impact to a larger sort of you know, view, evaluation is important for business, right? Whatever you're using in AI, it needs to be evaluated. It needs to be evaluated correctly. And it's definitely a evolving area with lots of challenges. With, seeing a lot of challenges in this area. So encouraging this conversation, you know, after this piano. And, but before that, um, I do want to, you know, we come back to a couple of tactical questions to provide some direct immediate value for some founders um, right now. Again, you know, let's, let's engage afterwards. Yeah, okay. So, um, so the, the next question, a little bit more tactical, yeah, coming back to, to the tactical side. Um, how should startups do that product development with AI? Actually, this is related yeah. to the previous question. Um, so it's, uh, it's a canned up, all right. So yeah, so how do we think about, right? From, if you are in software, um, how many people here in software? More than a half, right? So, okay. So, so you're very familiar with the whole software development and then, you know, agile and product roadmap, all of that. So how do you guys think the panelists think about from a product roadmap, right? Do you have any tips, any learning? I know we touched on this slightly, but John, yes. Yeah. I, and I think this question really relates to uh, the, the questions you've had from the audience, right? It's, the, the whole product development, it's a broader process, right? And what, when we got started, there were some good tools for ML ops, uh, but we felt that that was very much just at the center of the process. And we, we, we were looking for a production solution. We needed, we needed to go from capturing the data, preparing those data sets, get into the ML ops, putting these into production, and being able to explain it and verify it and validate it for our customers so they would feel comfortable with it, right? So that that software process is much broader than what we've been used to in the past. And to your point earlier, a lot of the tools are not there. And so we, we have to start filling those spaces. And that's there's a lot happening in the community, uh, but there's a lot that has to happen within, within your particular domain. And uh, I think, for us, it was that joining the particular domain expertise with that knowledge of the AI analytics and data, how to bring that all together. Yeah, I would just add, be obsessed with the problem. Right? Mm -hmm. Be yeah. obsessed with the problem that you're trying to solve for customers. Sometimes founders can get obsessed with their idea or technology, but if you're really customer obsessed, you're really thinking through what the problem is, you'll have insights that other people don't. I think the, the thing that's particularly interesting about uh, generative AI and kind of the revolution that we're seeing is that it allows you to rethink previous assumptions on how UI and UX and product can or should be built. And so I'll call like uh, a web page with 100 form fields that you type into as kind of the traditional web 2.0. And we see this everywhere from banks, insurance websites, shopping, et cetera. And so start to think, well, what is the AI user experience? And again, it, it can be a chatbot, doesn't have to be a chatbot. It can be conversational, it cannot be. Um, but the things that 
were best in class experiences in 2010 may not be best in class experiences in 2025. And so as a startup, you have the ability if your customer and problems obsessed to kind of question some of those assumptions. So back to the question. So uh, to the point about the agile process that our software engineers like are very familiar with that. So what I'm saying is that, so not just specific AI, anything like basically related to machine learning, data science, and AI. So my point is that uh, it's not necessary to entirely or strictly follow the agile process. Uh, so my experience is that, so it's it could be like totally customized like with your team. So. Uh, what 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 I may found is that uh, there are definitely valuable things in the agile process. For example, the planning, for example, the retro components, right? But given that the nature of the machine learning or AI development, there are a lot of uncertainties that on day one of the of the sprint, you're probably not able to foresee that, right? This will bring uh, bring actually extra pressure. That hey, so that needs like uh, say that hey, it's a two point ticket. That but tuning by ends up actually it's a five days, for example, right? So so I would say that definitely customize that so it's not really like if you just uh, directly port over the agile process in the space it's probably it's, it's not optimal yeah I, I definitely feel that pain so we work with a lot of engineer teams to incorporate these ai process so that spring planning is different because it's less well defined in many cases there's a lot more exploration and then to get that story points of certain things Right. So, I mean, if there's best practice, we, we start to really start to think about best practice because we're doing a lot of projects like this and we're really seeing that kind of pinpoints. So I'm uh, happy to, you know, hear if anyone has best practice and that testing component too, because usually when you have a software, right, all of the testing component is pretty well defined as well. But what we've uh, realized is a lot of the AI development, like you kind of have to test it before it hits a product. So there's that product testing, but then there's also a lot of earlier testing. And then the challenge we're hearing from um, product owners or business would just say, well, I don't know what is going on here, right? I don't know what the AI stuff you guys are doing. So that was some of the early questions that we get when we work with you know, business teams and product teams. And I assume any of you that going down that path, that's what um, also challenges will come up. Um, so yeah, so basically, uh, gradually find the best way work for your team. That's the most important. <laughs> OK, well, that's good advice. So um, well, thank you. I mean, leverage the framework of Agile, right? So it, it has it definitely has some benefits, right? I mean, a lot of benefits. But I mean, so don't like just be being rigid. So that's my point. Great. Um, so I wish we have longer time, but we have a what a hard um, stop at two, right? Okay. Oh yeah, sorry, <laughs> three. So uh, ten more minutes, and I do want to give the virtual folks um, some time that they can ask questions. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the questions you got virtually was, how do you train an LLM data set? with customer data or with open source data, specifically for product and go-to market? How to train your LLM with customized data or open source data to go to market? That's the question. So now we're going into the technical arena of the questions. Um, well, I can take that question. Any, anything coming from the panel? No, you can take this. Okay, I can take that question. Um, so the the training the the training side well m most when we talk about the training and the LLM most of the setting will be you're training something like a llama too or other open source models that we discussed earlier um, so there's these APIs right like uh, um, open AI so on and so forth if you want to train with open AI you are at the mercy of putting your data into their features for tuning. So they are, um, they are certainly opening those features, right? So you can collect your data, for example, your customized data, and then go through their process, including sending the data to them and calling their tuning APIs to tune their models. 
Um, so that's that's one pass. That if you're using an open API like like a, a, a you know open AI or any kind of commercial API like that, um, the downside of that is, well, a lot of us we have very specific data that uh, has privacy security concerns. So you're going to send something that you might have customer information, PII, so on and so forth, into an API where you don't know where things are going to go. And there is, hopefully not, but likelihood that will sort of spill over, right? When one of the concern, for example, one of our customers have it, what if my competitor pulls that? Now the OpenAI API is trained on that. What if my competitor pulls that and then our information get displayed? Um, of course, they are probably solving that problem right now. But the other path is to train something like Llama, which is comparable, more or less, to ChatGPT, let's say 3.5. And then a model like that, when you tune, um, first of all, yes, customer data, customized data, custom data, customized data, which is the important part that, Greg, you talked about earlier as your asset, your data asset that belongs to you. That training, when you use that, is going to provide you some of your IP because it belongs to you, and the model trend is going to reflect that. So to train that, um, there are algorithms like LoRa, right? Um, um, the I probably mispronounced it, but there are training, fine-tuning algorithms that you call to lay on top of something like Llama too. Since we have lots of engineers here, so hopefully I don't go into too many details. <laughs> of, uh, and then you feed in your custom data for that fine tuning process. Um, you can certainly use open source data as well. Now, of course, you have to collect that data up front. But that training itself is going to relate to a lot of the labeling stuff we talked about earlier, because the majority of it, you will at the at the end, you will have to do some ground truth evaluation. So it's, it's a really complex process, and uh, um, but uh, but if someone has more technical yeah. questions, Just we can discuss one later thing too. To add to that, most startups should probably not fine tune their own model. Uh, there's a lot of ways to customize the answer that these models give you, and if you have a lot of proprietary data, a very common way to do it is to vectorize your data using a vector database, and then be able to inject some of that custom data into a more complicated prompt uh, that will then be more tuned. The reason I say you should be very cautious of fine tuning a model is that the market is moving so quickly with new models and so many hundreds of millions of dollars are being spent to build these foundational models that it's very likely that three months, six months, nine months, and 12 months, there will be significantly better models out in the market that you will not be taking advantage because you've spent a lot of time and money and energy to build your own. So but, I'm going to disagree here. <laughs> well, but that's why we have a panel. For now there us. are reasons to build a custom model if you do have a lot of data. But like for a startup, you shouldn't automatically be like, let me train a custom model. You should try to leverage existing models until a point where you're confident that you will get significantly better results from a custom trained model. But, so, but wouldn't you still agree with them to start with? I agree with model. the foundational yeah. model. I would just say, I would say, yes, you're not building a foundational model, right? But I think a lot of situations do warrant a customized fine tuning with your own data when you at least get to that point, because that's where a lot of the IP stuff comes in. But I just got the five minutes mark here. <laughs> so um, is there any other question? Because we did quite a few questions here in person. We can take one more. Virtual. virtual, and if we have time, we can do one more in person. Okay. Yeah. Um, one of the questions that they asked virtually, which I'm very intrigued to know also, is how do you feel about OpenAI being controlled by Microsoft and becoming a commercial project? Okay. So <laughs> I'm going to let the, whoever wants to take that first. John is going I, to. <laughs> I, do, I do think it's funny that they left open in the name. So uh, maybe they'll change that along the way. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I don't necessarily believe that it's particularly controlled by Microsoft, more so that it's built on top of the Azure stack and has some enterprise tools built in. I think the, the bigger takeaway is, you know, that it's a commercial company as opposed to a, a, 
an entirely open nonprofit. And I do think that's interesting. As I said, history tends to repeat itself. And so as I think about what's happening in the AI landscape, there's a lot of mechanics that feel familiar to the mobile industry and how we had kind of a more closed centric ecosystem from Apple and then Google coming in with Android and a more open ecosystem. And it feels somewhat similar where OpenAI is a little more of a proprietary stack and Llama from uh, Meta is more of an open source stack. And so will we see a similar duopoly or will other you know platforms like Anthropic or others like Again, we'll, we'll see, but looking at history is, is definitely an important lesson. Oh, I, I think the encouraging thing is we have a lot of open source stuff still going on. And if you look at the, the landscape, it's just happening so fast, right? Um, from academia to industry, there's a lot of research churning out that is available to everybody. And uh, um, if you go to read the foundational paper, like Lama 2 paper and the other, like the transformer paper, any of these like really milestone papers, you will see a lot of the question we have today has been touched, including how to evaluate, including the labeling process. And then there's a lot of open source stuff coming out on top of that. So definitely a big advocate for open source, but I do think you know someone like OpenAI and who those with commercial, um, that there's a role for them, right? So there's a role for them to your point. So I think it's it's a very large ecosystem. We have a minute and a half left. So let's do one more question here. There's a question, so. Hi, uh, I'm a philosophy and business major at BU, and okay, is that better? Okay, so I really like the existential questions that we had at the beginning of everything. Uh, my question basically is like, since OpenAI and ChatGPT and like Llama and all these are like open, um, anyone can use it. Like, if if like student college students like use it for their work, whatever, and then like people like critical thinking and philosophy is like like dwindle down, then why not everyone just become an entrepreneur themselves if like the workforce in the labor market is no longer in like good condition as it once was, I guess. So like my ultimately my question is, why doesn't everyone become an entrepreneur with AI, I guess? Is that too broad? Um, the question is, why doesn't everyone become entrepreneurs because of AI? Well, I, I have a 17 year old daughter. I asked her if she wants to become an entrepreneur. The answer is a firm no. <laughs> she did con confess last week to me. She quote, I lost my last strong defense against the chat GPT. I'm using it for homework now. <laughs> so um, I don't know where does that lead to, but yeah, I don't know. What do you guys think? Is uh... I've been uh, researching entrepreneurship and actually building my own model on really entrepreneurship. And the answer is like entrepreneurship is very difficult and it's not certainly not for everybody. And so even though technologies allow you to have more vocational aspirations, whether you want to go into uh, entrepreneurship or something else, it's really up to the individual to align with a particular career path. And so uh, entrepreneurship remains high risk, high reward, and some people just don't like that. They, they want more stability, and so it's really aligned to the person. Or they like something else. Yeah. Thank you. I think we should end here. All right. Well, great questions, and thank you, everybody.